Welcome to The Fitness Doctor here on ESPN 730, the program where we address your exercise, nutrition, and overall health needs. And now an exer- exercise physiologist in the Department of the Sports Sciences at Wingate University, always the fitness doctor himself, Dr. John Aquaviva. Thanks, Troy. Uh, I want to welcome all of our listeners in studio today. I want to welcome uh, ex- fellow exercise physiologist John Ware. Uh, he's in with us again on, on this program. And uh, let's uh, talk about our topic of the day, uh, a basic overview uh, we're going to be talking about misconceptions and myths that are associated with working out, exercise in general. Uh, despite the fact that there are so many out- outlets of information like the web, uh, countless books and magazines, and fitness professionals, it seems that the myths about health in general even have grown rather than have been lessened. We'll talk more about this right after. Uh, Troy, you got some uh, – uh, what's in store for us today actually? Yep. The show rundown today, special guest John Ware. We have the Q&A with Dr. A, my favorite part of the show, social media breakdown, and we also have the Research Minute. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about my guest. You guys have some background information on him. Uh, John is from Richmond, Virginia. We've been friends for a long time, but as much as anything, I trust him and I respect him as an exercise physiologist. He's a personal trainer. In fact, has a personal training studio in Richmond, Virginia. John, thanks again for being here. You're Welcome. You're yeah, looking forward to this it. one, Absolutely, especially man. the myths and misconceptions of exercise. I'm ready to go. Um, all right, we're turning your microphone up just for this particular <laughs> okay. one. So we know that there's a lot of issues involving uh, this particular uh, topic, on, and it's, it's actually an endless conversation. And the most interesting thing is that because of all these outlets, it actually hasn't lessened. I think it's actually gone up. And one of the most um, fascinating points is this research article I found is – going to be how we end the show, but uh, how even people in the field have a lot of misconceptions about uh, working out and, and uh, fitness in general. Um, Troy, what's next on the, uh, on the segment today? Well, quickly, I just want to let you guys know for all your listeners, if you have questions regarding today's topic or like to request a future topic, follow us on Twitter at Woo Fitness Doctor. That's W-U Fitness Doctor. Or be sure to like our page on Facebook, Wu Fitness Doctor, and can always reach out to us via email, Wu Fitness Doctor at Wingate.edu. All right, Doc, time for my favorite part of the show. Me and you get to break it down real quick. Quick Q&A with Dr. A. Are you ready, Doc? I'm ready. All right. Question number one. Number one myth. Number one myth associated with exercise has to be that we can do what's called spot reduction. People have come to me year after year, almost day after day, saying, if I do more sit-ups, for instance, will I lose fat in my midsection? And I always look at them and just say, eat less, run more if you want to lose weight in your, in your midsection. Yeah, so that's the number one myth. They think they can do what's called spot reduction. Can't be done. All right, awesome. Question number two. Why do most women shy away from weight training? Because they fear that they're going to get big and they're not going to fit into their clothes and they're going to look as muscular as their husband. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a big-time myth. In fact, the main reason it's a myth is because, um, because of two things, really. Testosterone levels, it's about one-seventh of that of a guy, and this is the main hormone that's involved in producing new muscle cells. So it, they have a really hard time getting bigger. And uh, the second thing is, it takes a lot of effort. Even if you have plenty of testosterone, it, you have to work really hard. And a lot of people just don't have that time or energy in them. All right, let's wrap it up with question three. Can the elderly benefit from weight training? Yes. In fact, anybody who weight trains, it doesn't matter whether they're 18 or 80, they're going to benefit from weight training. Well, Every- Dr. John's a good example of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, what am I, closer to 80 or eight? 18? <laughs> All right, that was the quick Q&A with Dr. A. Back to you, Doc. Okay, let's talk about some basic, uh, other basic uh, myths and misconceptions. I think another one, John, on that list is that muscle, when we stop working out, turns to fat. And and then vice versa, that people think that fat turns to muscle when uh, they start working out. Let me break that down. First things first, that muscle turns into fat. People think that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. People think all all kinds of stuff. Okay. Uh, But yeah, I I think this is a a big one on that list. Um, Let's talk about the latter one first. When people start working out and they have excess body fat, they think that um, the reason that they get more trim is that there's been a transformation in those cells, that the fat cells turn into muscle cells. And, and actually what happens is that because we're working out, fat 
cells go down. They're burned as a form of energy, and muscle cells go up as a result of putting some type of resistance against that. And right. so there's the appearance that fat turns into muscle. And then, of course, vice versa is true in people who gain weight. They think, gosh, I used to be in good shape, and all this muscle has turned into fat. And all that's happened is they've gone through atrophy, and they've gained a little bit of adipose tissue, or in some cases, a lot of adipose tissue, and uh, it, it's, it seems like um, – yeah. That's the case. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, a lot of concern for uh, you, you get a lot of, uh, of women talking about how their clothes don't fit, and it and it stopped fitting once they started doing weight training, and so they try to avoid the weight training. But in in actuality, they didn't make the nutritional adjustments to get rid of the fat. Now the muscle is toned, so the texture of the muscle changes for yeah. a woman, but generally not the size. Now I know there are some freaks out there, there are some freak shows out there. We don't need to go down that road, but. Um, <laughs> But typically, when you see that your clothes aren't fitting properly because you think weight training is making them tighter, it's, it's more about that you're not doing what's necessary to get rid of the body fat. Now, l- let me shoot this at you. What, what are some of the misconceptions that you've run in? Now, you've been training people as long as I have. It's, it's uh, 20 years plus. Yeah. Uh, you've worked with some uh, Olympic athletes. Mm-hmm. You've worked with house moms. You've worked with everybody in between. What would you say is uh, other biggest? I, I, I would just go right back to what we were talking about. I think um, it's really a challenge to convince a female to be, um, especially upper body. I know I see a lot of uh, women who don't mind doing the things on the lower body, but they don't want to do what's necessary on top. And and I have to, you know, we have to break it down and help them understand that it's about being metabolic. And the more physical you can be, the more metabolic you are. And that requires the whole body to be involved. So Absolutely. that's one of the big things I deal with. I think we need some social media info at this point. Yep, Doc, you know what time it is. Time for the social media breakdown. I have a question. Tweet in here from at the real deal 49 and he wants to know, does a fat burning zone exist? <laughs> this is one of the great <laughs> questions, right? This is a the great question. What, what, this, um, uh, this, what this individual is referring to is when you get on a treadmill, for instance, or elliptical machine, any type of of cardio-based machine, there's often uh, selections that you can make right. as far as how hard you work, the intensity, and so forth. And one of them that has got to be the most pressed button, in fact, probably all the letters have, have gone away. Fat burn. Yeah, as yeah. a result of that. And they hit the fat burn button. And and all that means is is that they're going to be working out at a r- relatively low intensity level. Yeah, it's sort of the over-commercialization of science That's is right. what it is. It Absolutely. just made science a little bit easier to understand by making it a one-button situation. But the problem is that it doesn't, it doesn't specifically – it's not geared – that intensity is not geared towards your personal physiology. That's it's right. It's geared towards sort of an average person. That's right. So it's oftentimes not super yeah, they don't. In other words, they don't really know much about the individual who's on that particular exactly. machine. Exactly. But the big, but the big issue is, is this. It's a percentage versus an amount thing. In other words, in the fat-burning zone, you're going to burn a higher percentage of fat. Right. Like, for instance, say 50 to 60%. Versus if you work out harder, you might burn 30%. But the fact is, is you will get a better workout at that 30%. Because here's why. 30% of a larger number is more calories from fat. And also, we get more health benefits from the higher intensity training as well. Right. There's a, there's, you're always burning a combination of both. It's a whole spectrum. And, and where you are in that spectrum, there's an optimal sort of window. And it's dictated by your fitness level and your age and all that. So it does pay to sort of understand the science a little bit, and um, that way you can reduce the volume of work. So instead of wearing out your body, you can kind of hone it in and be more specific about what you're doing and get a better result. Well, I see uh, Troy jumping up and down. But before he, he gives this the next uh, uh, question, um, what is uh, – my, my guess is, especially in all your personal training days, you educate as much as you train, don't you? Oh, sure. It's about empowering them. Yeah, because uh, you know, they have to leave with a result, and, and that result has to sort of stay with them. And so if you kind of treat it like magic, then they'll be back and they'll be frustrated because they'll, <laughs> they'll, you know, they'll be right back to where they started from. So it, it, you got to teach them. And, and just uh, now we were talking about myths about exercise, but do you address more myths regarding exercise or regarding weight loss and diet more? Which, uh, which do you- nutrition mostly they're fascinated um, by that aren't they? yeah i mean i only have control of their of their fitness for an hour and i don't have any control over their nutrition but that's typically going to be 90 percent of the equation is to is to sort of always stay on them about the things they need to do the the nutritional adjustments we like to say but john they make really tiny cameras i think we can put that on their your clients and you can watch them a little I, I'd, better i right? thought about it absolutely <laughs> how'd you know i had a donut yesterday for breakfast <laughs> all right what else we got 
Bell Triggers. We just got an email from Rose in Huntersville. <laughs> And she wants to know, are sit-ups needed for a smaller waist? I think this goes back to our program last week. Uh, no, no, we were talking about this earlier today as the number one number one myth. Yeah. yeah people have thought this, I think, since uh, cavemen, right? This right. is truly the age-old myth. Uh, sit-ups are actually good. It develops strength in the core. <clears throat> we need the core to be strong. It certainly helps support the lower back. All, all that's good, even necessary, especially for older people, especially if, if you start to gain weight in the midsection. But the key is is that we have to understand that it's not really going to make any fat go away in that particular area. We, our body does not know how to spot reduce, and we just need to get rid of that. Yeah, so if it's a body fat issue, right on the mark. But there are people who have what I call lazy abs okay, who, who don't like to contract the abdominal muscle very often, and they tend to stretch and just sort of hang out there. And, and over time, they, they can't pull them in anymore. So, you know, they will, uh, doing sit-ups will reduce your, your waist. But to a degree, if there's yeah. a lot of body fat, that's that's a whole other. Yeah, issue. Th- then you have to, then you have to address two other things: cardio and then right. you know donuts for breakfast. Yeah, exactly. In the morning. Got it. Um, okay, what, what what else do we have at this point? Actually, um, why, why don't we turn to the research minute? Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, let's see. The uh, this is this was actually pretty fascinating. Uh, this the title of this article was um, the common. Student Misconceptions and Exercise Physiology. And so what they did is they took – these researchers didn't take just people from the street or from clubs like yours, but they took exercise physiology students and they asked them a bunch of questions involving exercise and fitness. And they wanted to see if they could determine that they were actually looking at miss. And, and granted, for those who are going to go to this uh, article and, and read it, they're going to find out that – there was uh, these questions weren't just your everyday common questions, but they were designed for exercise physiology students and something that they should have known mm-hmm. or they expected them to know. They gave them ten questions, and nine out of the ten they could not determine whether it was a misconception or not. In other words, only one of them they determined uh, that was a misconception. The other nine they said, "No, I think that's true," and this just goes along with why mis- misconceptions perpetuate and why they just kind of exist in society because the very people that should be teaching them the against experts. it. Yeah. yeah. So the writing is on the wall. So, there. so maybe we're given too many degrees yeah, out. Exactly. Or, too easily. Or, or if nothing else, maybe we should be addressing that basic stuff as well as some of the other serious physiology. Indeed. Right. Uh, Troy, how, how can these folks stay in touch with us? All right, guys, you can stay in touch with us and learn more about the research minute. If you head over to our Facebook and Twitter page, that's at Wu Fitness Doctor, W U Fitness Doctor. And as always, feel free to email us at uh, Wu Fitness Doctor at Wingate.edu. That's a lot of Wu Fitness Doctor. So if they just, if they, woo, yeah, Wu Wu. So if they just remember Wu Fitness Doctor, W U, they're probably going to be okay. Yeah, one of the three. Right. And, um, and of course, they can always contact you directly. In fact, can I give out your cell phone? Oh, yeah, number? go ahead. <laughs> Okay, uh, let, let's. Uh, we're going to take a break at this moment, and uh, we'll be more. We'll be back with more of the Fitness Doctor after this message. This is ESPN Radio. Your extraordinary future begins at Wingate University with more than thirty-five undergraduate majors and graduate and professional programs in the health sciences, business, and education. Wingate University's enrollment has mushroomed, and construction has skyrocketed in the past two decades. And Wingate is the sixth best value in the South, according to U.S. News and World Report. Most importantly, Wingate graduates get jobs. They're working all over the Carolinas and the U.S. Major in a great life at Wingate University. Hi, and welcome back to The Fitness Doctor, the program where we address your exercise, nutrition, and overall needs. I'm Dr. John Aquaviva, an exercise physiologist in the Department of Sports Sciences at Wingate University. I want to welcome again John Ware, a fellow exercise physiologist, John, you ready to go again? Woo woo. <laughs> you guys will get that as the show goes on. Troy, what do we have for this segment? All right, Doc. For this segment, we are still happy to have John Ware in studio. Second, we have the Q&A with Dr. A. Third, social media breakdown. Fourth, we have the research minute. This all sounds great. I can't wait to get to it. So let's, uh, let's talk about the framework of today's topic, which is fad dieting. And as, as we're talking about in, in the first segment of the show, uh, let's face it, John. There's you and I can talk a pretty mean, uh, or pretty have a pretty mean discussion about exercise and about uh, training and different forms of it and so forth. But we can talk and talk and talk, and then people will go, "What about dieting? What about nutrition? What about weight loss?" Right? And right, so that's one exactly. of the reasons why people just love to talk diets because they're trying to actually corner 
what, what is what is exactly should I be doing? Trying to find the magic bullet. And the magic bullet, John, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Yeah, but if we find it, we'll tell people, right? In fact, we'll tell we'll them sell on this it. show. Yeah, we'll <laughs> sell it. Very good. Um, can we go 50-50, though? Because my guess is you'll find it before I do. We'll, we'll talk. All right. We'll um, talk. But <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was a French, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, just like with exercise, there's a lot of information on what are the best diets to lose weight, gain energy, and improve health. But let's face it, many of them are designed to help people lose weight by taking in far less calories than you expend. And that's one of the issues with fad dieting is people will see the diet and then they say, does this work? And if they find out somebody has lost weight with it, they don't, almost don't care what's in that diet as long as that bottom line is – I've lost weight. Now, that, that's important, right? Because we have this Absolutely. 67% of the American uh, adult population is either overweight or obese, and we need to address that somehow. And these 67%, most of them, at least some of them, are desperately trying, and they found out that the traditional diet or what they think is a good traditional diet is not working for them. Before we go any further today, we are here on the campus of Wingate University asking students what they think about fad diets or if they've ever tried fad diets for themselves. And to help me out today, I've brought along social media expert of the fitness doctor, Michelle Jocker. Michelle, how are you doing today? Doing well, Troy. Thank you. So happy to be here. Um, I know nothing about fad diets. No. Do you know anything about juicing or any fad diets that are going on around Hollywood right now or anything that you've actually tried yourself? No, I don't know any of them. Have you ever tried a fad diet or do you know of any fad diets? I have actually never tried a fad diet. Um, I'm kind of one of those eat whatever I want, whenever I want people, so I've never tried one. I mean, I've heard of all of them from Atkins to gluten-free to all the ones that have recently come out today of the apple pie diet or whatever. Um, I know there's a South Beach diet. I know there's a juicing diet. Um, there's actually the uh, maple syrup diet. It just has cayenne pepper in it, and you just drink that for 10 straight days. Most people use about 20 to 30 pounds. Would you try juicing, or are you mainly, you know, weightlifting? Weightlifting. I don't, I don't juice. Michelle, I'd still have to say the chocolate fad diet, my favorite by far. But I want to thank Michelle for coming and helping me out today, and it's time to send it back to the studio to the doc. Doc, you know what that means? I do know what that means, but tell me anyway. All right. Quick Q&A on? of the day with Dr. A, my favorite part of the show. All right, question number one, let's get to it. Why has high protein been so popular? High protein diet, why has it been so popular? It's because it has uh, helped people lose weight. And ultimately, it's based on this very fact that if you are asked to eat as much protein as you can, which actually some of the diets have, have asked people to do, you'll eventually get so tired of eating bacon and steak that you'll your overall caloric intake will be so low that you're bound to lose weight. And so they just think it's a magic steak or magic bacon that they've been eating. <laughs> right. All right. Question number two, which one is the worst? Where do I start? <laughs> There's a lot to be said here. Yeah. In fact, I don't have enough ink in this pen to say which one's the best. So many of them are awful. Let's, uh, let's talk about a couple by name though. In fact, just you, you guys will get the effect just by the name of it. The cabbage soup diet, the, the chocolate diet, and my favorite, the Russian astronaut diet. I'll stick with, I'll stick with number two, the chocolate diet. It's a winner right there. <laughs> In fact, uh, um, Troy, that's most everybody's favorite. <laughs> All right. And question number three to wrap it up. Is there any food that increases your metabolism? Of course. I'm just kidding. No, there's no – in fact, the answer is a very strong no. Uh, th- this has uh, been uh, – you know, this has been a common myth, I think. Like, for instance, um, lemons and celery – and um, cantaloupe and several other things. Spicy food? Sp- yeah, spicy food, very good. Because it makes you hot, it must therefore um, make you burn more calories. So uh, the answer again is no. All right, that was the quick Q&A of the day with, with Dr. A. And now back to the doc. Okay, uh, let, let's see. Well, let's talk about something uh, common here. The thing that they have in common is less calories. That's ultimately. That, that's ultimately. In fact, if you look up this uh, chocolate diet, in fact, I can see people right now going rushing to their computers going, what? There's a, something called the, uh, you know, and then they hear angels singing, right? They're like, <laughs> this is fantastic. I, I knew I should have listened to this show, and I, and I knew I should have tuned in today, and now it's all coming through. Here's what almost every one of them has in common. They require you to eat far less calories than you burn in a given day. Like, for instance, in this chocolate diet, now I can't quote it. I've read it actually a couple times. We talk about it in the the nutrition classes that I teach, and we just make fun of it constantly. 
But like, for instance, in the morning, it's like not just water, but uh, lemon in your water. Mm -hmm. And then it's like a half a piece of toast, a cup of black coffee. And then that's it for breakfast. And then at lunch, you eat a half a bowl of popcorn. uh, You eat another, uh, you drink another glass of water with lemon in it. And then you have a piece of chocolate. And that's when everybody's, you know, spirits go up. And they're like, can I have more? And then the diet people say, no, you can't. That's why it's But you're your fork because you just had chocolate. <laughs> so you right. don't care. That's right. So you're basically up to this point or at this point up to around uh, 140 calories. Yeah, you're starving. <laughs> you're starving to death. And, that, and ultimately what it comes down to as I started this whole segment is that they're taking in far less calories than they should. And uh, my guess is with your clients and, – and John, tell the folks about uh, the average client that you train. It's – it's women, and they're generally middle aged, and they're mothers and or um, wives. You know, yeah, yeah. You hit the hit the head nail on the head. Um, and and nutritionally, um, the way I try to help people understand this, it's about I think you mentioned it before, blood sugar control. Yeah, and a lot of these diets have some of that built in. I mean, obviously, there's the caloric control, uh, the you know the volume of the of the food, but but blood sugar management can be pretty important when it comes to to losing weight, and so uh, the more protein in your diet, that can sort of help manage the spikes that you would get. Right. Um, the the low carb stuff um, can do that as well. So that's what it comes down to: is understanding how your blood sugar reacts to the food you eat. And, and honestly, if you eat healthy, varied uh, types vegetables, fruits, it, it, you can eat healthy and not have to worry about being a, obsessive about a particular type of food. And lose weight because you're trying to make your body more energized. So okay. if you eat healthy food, you can work harder. Let's let's talk about what healthy is because th- that's just it. A lot of times people will hear the cabbage diet or whatever the diet is. Yeah. Oh, okay, the, the paleo diet or whatever the, the high-protein diet is. They're saying, you know, if the author says make sure when you eat high-protein that you're eating lean meats, people tend to go, well, oh, that's eating healthy. And then it kind of tricks them into thinking that's the way you should eat all the time. Yeah, they go obsessive with it. Yeah. yeah. And, and so let's talk about what is healthy. And maybe, you know, in, in, uh, you know, to the viewer and, and Troy as our witness, we, we didn't practice this off air. But what are some basic components of healthy eating? I, I think you would agree with me. Uh, smaller meals throughout the day, maybe up to five or six meals. Yep. Um, a lot of colors on your plate. And I don't mean the colors of M&Ms, but I mean the same <laughs> colors, but in the form of fruits and vegetables. Yep. Right. And getting vitamins and minerals through their natural form. Always the best. Always the best. And um, like, for instance, white meat over red meat, at least on most occasions, more fish than, say, steak. And yeah, so less forth. saturated fat involved yeah. with that. And then, uh, and then when we eat fats, fats are great. In fact, not, not only good, but they're great, but in the form of peanuts. The right kind of fats. That's right. And, and it's, it's not rocket science. It's been talked about for years. But because it's nothing new, people just have a hard time listening to it. They, they are ultimately convinced that we are keeping some information from them. Yeah. Yeah, like we have all the secrets, but um, and, and we're only going to release it if they give us sixty dollars an hour, <laughs> rather than the forty you're getting right now. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, uh, it's a struggle, and I always tell people you can't you can't out train out train a bad diet. I mean, if you aren't willing to make those nutritional adjustments, you're spinning your wheels. So you Tr- have to try write that yeah. down. Say that again. You can't. I want credit for it. Full credit. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, you can't train a bad diet, and no, so um, you know it's a big part of of, of getting uh, your weight under control. Yeah, absolutely, sure. good stuff. What do we got? Social media breakdown, Doc. Let's real, do it. Real pumped. All right, we have from uh, from Twitter here. We have at Steve Z seventy three. He wants to know what classifies a diet as a fad. Yeah, there's no, there's no definition on this. What is a fad diet? But it generally means ones that. Like an obsession. If there's some sort of built-in obsession, I would think makes yeah. it a fad, don't you Yeah. Think? In fact, maybe even if there's a book, if right? there's a book? Yeah. If they're talking about it on a Today Show or something else like that, then it's probably a fad because anything that rises quickly is going to fall quickly. And that it's the same with bands and you know, rock bands or, or pop bands or just you know, musicians in general. It's the same thing with a lot of things in our society. If it rises really quickly, then it's usually going to fall pretty quickly as well. There's no timeline for a fad, but... I would think that it's, uh, you know, something that comes and goes pretty quickly. All right. Also from Charlotte, we have Larry and Larry would like to know, would you recommend any fad diets? Other than the uh, Russian astronaut diet. Now, if that sounds uh, impartial or or partial to that part of the world, but um, no, there's not one that I would necessarily recommend. 
And last one, Rose from Huntersville. She said, is cleansing possible through any diet? Rose asks a great question. And and it's because of this. Um, one of the, the fads, and, and actually this has been around for a few months, but uh, juicing is one of the diets that's out there that has claimed to cleanse. And while I could go on further, I'm going to keep to the, um, you know, to the, process that we have going on here, quick Q&A, and that is it promises uh, cleansing, does juicing, but first of all, there's no definition for cleansing, so we'll just end on that. All right, uh, let, let's let's move on from here and uh, continue talking about um, uh, fad dieting and so forth, but let's talk more about juicing because I, I kind of cut myself off short there. Juicing, uh, of course, is is really just that, but it's it goes a little beyond that in that there's, um, you know, when we tend to think of juice, we tend to think of fruit, but a lot of vegetables are put in there as well. And it's a mm-hmm. good source of, of vitamins and minerals, and it's a good way to get our recommended servings of um, fruits and vegetables. No question. But the issue is the lack of calories, and it well, comes back and, down to that. And again. the fiber. I mean, when you juice, you're taking a majority of the fiber out. I mean, that's what makes fruit healthy is it, it helps to slow the absorption time down. It keeps your blood sugars from spiking. So when you juice— you're basically ending up with a with a glass of Kool Aid. Right. Essentially, that's what your body will recognize it as. And you know what the irony is is that one of the things that to use that term that helps clean your system, right? That, that is good for it's your digestive system is the fiber. And exactly. the very thing that helps cleanse, if we could say that, is the fiber. And they're pulling that that very thing out. But it does come down to this: people who juice, especially if they juice as not just the, a supplement, but if they juice regularly. That means they're not going to get enough calories in, and that's why they swear by ju- juicing. Yeah, and they're going to get they're going to get spikes. They're going to get yeah. blood sugar spikes. But not only that, they're not going to take in near as many calories, and their energy is going to be low. But they're going to lose weight, so therefore they think it's an effective way yeah, to die. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's move on to um, uh, something that we call the research minute, and this is where we take an article that has been published in the last few years that is deals directly on the topic at hand, and this is from the Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism. 2009, the effects of a popular exercise and weight loss program on weight loss, body composition, energy expenditure, and health in obese women. That's a, that's a mouthful for sure. But what they did is they had several groups. They had no exercise and no diet. They had exercise and no diet. And then, of course, in the third group, they had exercise and then various diets. And here's what they found. The people who lost the most weight, who lost the most inches in in their arms and in their waist and in their thighs and so forth, were, of course, the people who exercised and dieted. But further, what they found out was the people who ate the higher protein diet of the several diets that they used actually had the greatest amount of weight loss. Now, here's what we don't know about this. We don't know what the long-term effect is. In other words, this was just done over a period of weeks. We don't know what's going to happen if they were to keep on that same regimen of high-protein diet, say, for a year. In fact, we yeah, know— There's Jack, likely a rebound. That's right. That's right. And the rebound is what? what? What's going to happen? The weight's going to come back. Probably it's going to come back because you're going to start eating carbohydrates again, and then ultimately your caloric intake yeah, is going to be high. It's but, not practical yeah. to eat the high-protein stuff. It's not. So let's give out that uh, social media info one more time, Troy. Yeah, for uh, for more on the research minute, or if you just want to know more about the chocolate diet, be sure to head over to our Facebook page and Twitter page at Woo Fitness Doctor, and on Facebook it's the same W U Fitness Doctor. And yeah, be sure to check us out. Both articles will be up there. Awesome. All right, I want to thank my guest today, uh, John Ware. John, Pleasure. we want you to come back. I'll be back for Absolutely. sure. All right. And, uh, folks, the uh, saying for the show, it goes like this. Remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. Join us again uh, next time on The Fitness Doctor. This is ESPN Radio.